So today we'll be talking about how to improve customer lifecycle management through big data and data collected from the Internet of Things. And in the first part of the presentation, we'll talk about just, you know, what is big data? What is the IoT? And why is this information that we're collecting important? Then we'll show some examples that are actually in production today of how companies are using data from big data sources in the IoT. Then finally, for the last part of the presentation, we'll be going through each phase of the customer lifecycle and showing how you can use big data in the Internet of Things to improve customer relationships and increase customer satisfaction, all while increasing revenues for yourself. So what exactly is big data? Big data is any really large set of data that you're collecting. This could be from typical sources like CRM systems and ERPs, to anything from Twitter or Yelp, which are unstructured and a little bit harder to collect and interpret. Then one of the other sources of information we'll be looking at today is data collected from the Internet of Things. This is any information that's collected from a sensor or a device that's connected to the Internet. So this could be a street lamp or it could be information collected from a Fitbit or information collected from different parts of the engine on your car. If you did have just a standalone Internet of Things solution that takes that information and translates it into insights, that's interesting. But it gets really interesting and really valuable when you start combining it with information that you're also collecting from big data sources. When this information is merged, that's when the value really starts to show itself. So why is all of this data important that we're collecting today? Well, first of all, customers now expect the sales process to not only be smooth, but also to be personal. They don't have time, or at least they don't think they have time, to go through a multitude of websites doing research. They want something where you're going to come to them with a personalized service or personalized recommendations. Um, and they feel this way because there are so many options out there with our access to the Internet. They feel they're not limited to, you know, people in their state or even their region. They are exposed to things that, you know, come from you know, different countries. If you don't offer that personalized service, there probably is another company that can offer at least some level of personalization to them, and they will choose that service many times. Big data and data from the IoT, they'll help you not only personalize products or services to a customer, so it'll help you get a better picture of your consumer. So by seeing, you know, what are they putting in an online shopping cart? What are they taking off? How are they moving through a store? This will really help you see them as a complete person. And then finally, because you understand them a little bit better and you're collecting this great free market research, you're actually able to provide to them a personalized level of service and improve their customer satisfaction. And so with this, when we have a happy, satisfied customer who is getting the services and products they need or being alerted to products and services that they probably will like, we can increase sales as a company. And we can increase that while they're still interacting with us because it's much more valuable to get a sale or to get information to a customer about a product that they may like while that customer is still interacting with the system or in your store. And this too really not only improves sales, but it can increase inventory turns for a retail establishment or even an online store, and then reduce spoilage if you are in the grocery business or something similar, deal with perishable goods. So currently, how are companies using this information that they're collecting? Well, if you see on the left-hand side of the screen, Target is using this with their app Cartwheel. If anyone's ever used it, it's an app you have on your phone and every Sunday and, you know, every few days also, they will go and they'll change the different offers on there. So what you do is, and I know I personally from experience, I used to love on Sunday mornings to sit down and look at my Cartwheel app and in the ad and see, you know, what did I need that week or what did I just really want that week that was a good deal on Cartwheel. And as I searched through for products, I would add them to my cart wheel. And with it, the products that were on here, if you added them to your cart, you were given additional discounts off of, you know, the traditional selling price at Target or the, the items that were on sale already, you got an additional discount on. So that way, when you went to the store, 
and you, you know, actually bought these things, you would hand your phone to the salesperson and they would bring up a barcode and then they would scan it and you'd get all the additional discounts off of it. However, this does take a while and, you know, once, you know, you get a little bit more busy in your life from, you know, either work or a family, it really was a time intensive process. With it, the recommendations that they were giving to me were not really personalized. It was stuff that I was not interested in. It, it was a very long process where I would go through and, you know, see like, okay, is Purina dog food on sale this week? And I have to type it in, put it in. And it really took a, a lot of time and effort. So I stopped using it actually. Um, I use it just really when I need to go to Target now and, you know, I'll scan stuff as I go through the store and see if the thing that I'm actually just gonna buy is on sale or on cartwheel, and then I'll do it at the end. However, if there would be a more automated process to this, they probably would get a lot more people using cartwheel. The next example is Siemens. Siemens, we think of as just a traditional, very old school manufacturing company. Um, however, they're incorporating RFID technology and sensor technology into a lot of the factories that they're helping set up. For example, they have a shampoo factory that they created, and with it, on each bottle of shampoo is labeled with a little RFID, and that RFID will tell the machine not only what shampoo goes in it, but how much shampoo, the label that needs to go in that shampoo, and then what type of box to put it in. They're really taking a lot of that human interaction out and they're making the process much more seamless and also much more accurate, which is really great. Uh, then finally, this city that I have up here on the right hand side of the screen, this is Kansas City, and they are actually one of the premier smart cities in the United States. They've invested a lot of time and money into these initiatives. Um, one of the initiatives that they've done is actually they've set up kiosks all around the city that talk about you know different things going on in the city and they're collecting that information and also they're using it as a Wi-Fi hotspot. However, they're just doing a lot of collecting at this point, not a lot of interpretation. So with it, they could actually include things in here where you can purchase tickets to these attractions and avoid the lines. So I know I personally would rather pay a small convenience fee than have to stand in a very long line, you know, to get into some of the museums in the Chicago area. You could even charge the attraction a fee so that way the end user isn't affected. They also could start generating a lot of ad revenue based on, you know, who is actually using the kiosk. They could start modifying bus routes and, you know, based on who is walking by. There's a lot of ways that they could not only improve the efficiencies of the city, um, but also generate revenue, which is really important too. So with it now, we're going to move on to the customer life cycle. For this presentation, I'm limiting the customer life cycle to five stages. So that of reach, acquire, convert, retain, and loyalty. So the first step is reach. And this is when potential customers just first become aware of your product. So this could be anything from, you know, they've attended a trade show where you're at and they find out about your company or they're online and they Google in, you know, whatever they're looking for and your company comes up and they go to your website. Um, it also could be a referral from a, a loyal customer that you have. At this stage, you do not know a lot about your customer. They have not registered at your site. They may have gone to your website, but that's really it. But it's still very critical that even though we don't know this customer, that you keep recording information about this, even if it's anonymous. So metrics really are very key at this stage too. So with it, you need to collect anonymous data. So how can we collect this anonymous data, you may ask? Well, each device that we have, whether it's a smartphone, a tablet, or a computer, if it's online, can be recorded and can be tracked using a unique machine ID. Even though you might not know that, you know, Rebecca's phone is machine, you know, one, two, three, you can still record that machine one, two, three, you know, went to your website and spent 30 minutes browsing the site, which is very informative that you know this person is probably very interested in your website if they are actively browsing for that long. And then you can store that information for when they do eventually register and can mine that information. So if you're online, let's say with it, I, for example, go to Moda Nordstrom's rack and I'm browsing through several products <clears throat> and I really like this purse. If you have a solution in place, 
you can record how long I actually looked at this bag. Let's say I looked at this bag for 90 seconds. So not only did I look through here, but I read the full product description. I looked through all the pictures. Um, with it, you not only want to record that, hey, I looked at this picture, you want to record all these other things that I'm doing. So, you know, I, I looked through all the pictures, I scrolled down. If I scroll down, where did I stop reading? Did I finish after the product description or before? Because that way, if I spent a lot of time on this picture or on this, this purse looking at it and perusing, you know, I'm interested. Whereas if I looked at this purse, clicked on it and then clicked off, you know, I may have done it by accident or I decided I just really didn't like, you know, the color, the shape, something. You want to record too that not only am I doing this, but you want to associate it with the machine ID that I'm on. Because remember, at this point, I haven't even registered for this, this website. You don't know who I am. You just know I'm machine one, two, three. For example, if you know I look at this, I'm not really in the mood to buy today or I get distracted, you save all this information. So when I do come back to your site, you can then give me personalized recommendations. So I'm not presented with a purse that's $3,000 when I'm looking at something that's about 130. I'm presented with products that are personalized and you know they're all sort of the same shape as the one that I looked at before. As a customer, this not only shows that I'm getting this personalized experience, but with it I'm presented with information and products that there's a high likelihood that I like. It's not going to show me something that, as I mentioned before, was $3,000 or, you know, like a little wristlet. It's going to show me a, a, a larger bag by a similar designer in a similar price range. We can collect this information, even if it is anonymous, and turn it into a personalized experience. The next phase in the customer life cycle is acquisition. So this is going to be your first official contact with a new customer. So they are registering for your website or they are to sign up for a newsletter. This is going to be something where they officially say, hey, you know, I am interested. I want to learn a little bit more. This step, though, abandonment is extremely rampant. So it's critical to make that experience a little bit more personalized and convince them that you're a good fit for them. This, if they've registered for your site, this is a good time to connect their past browsing experience if it was anonymous to their new account because that way you still have that information that they've done in the past you're not starting off at square zero if they've registered you know they're interested and now you need to keep track of their trail of breadcrumbs make sure that they are presented with offers they like use that anonymous data from the past this will help you know them better and give them more targeted recommendations however if you know they've just registered maybe to receive a newsletter or if they haven't really registered yet they just didn't quite finish the registration process or they've just contacted you for sales but you don't really know you know their their demographic information their preferences things like that still continue tracking. You need to remember their trail, whether this is walking through a store or browsing through a website, no matter what. So if, for example, you're doing this in store in like a retail establishment, you want to make sure that you're tracking how your customer is moving through the store. And you can do this by having sensors set up throughout your store and then keeping track of those machine IDs that are on the person's phone. And if they're registered, it's great because you can interact with that potential client as they walk through the store. And the goal is to get them to move then to that convert step. So you want to make sure you're presenting them with the best offers for them. So for example, let's say a customer's registered online and then they decide to go to the store after they've you know done research on your website, maybe even created a shopping cart. So even if they've taken stuff out of their shopping cart, you still need to keep track of that. So the customer decides to come into the store and they're geolocated. Once they come into the store, the customer is then presented through the app. Any coupons or offers based on that historical information collected while they were browsing the website or stuff they put in their cart and then maybe took out of their cart. You want to give them relevant information to them. If you were looking for women's tops, you don't necessarily want to present them with power tools immediately. If, for example, I was going in into a store and I had been researching online uh, windshield wipers. So I go to the store, I'm walking through, and as soon as I walk in, it's like, oh, you know, I know you like car parts. So giving me a coupon for windshield wipers, maybe I get a coupon for windshield wiper fluid, or it points me in the direction 
of windshield wipers that are on sale that you have a lot of inventory of and that you need to push out of the store. As the customer moves throughout the store, she's notified with similar items. So it's not only upon entry to the store, it's also when they're around different products that you think that they may be interested in. And it's not just randomly, it's based on their historical information and then historical information, uh, purchasing information of customers that are similar to them. Really use this opportunity in real time while they are in the store to reach out to them and alert them about products that they might be interested in. Because at this point, we wanna get them to not only put the stuff in the cart, but then also take it to the checkout. The idea of conversion. This is when they actually make it to the checkout counter with their products. So you've already shown them that there's value in your product. Now you just have to close the sale. And so you need to do this with a personalized, non-scripted method. Um, while they're experiencing your product or survey. You don't want them to feel like it's scripted because then that has actually the opposite effect. So they don't want something generic. And then not only do you want it to be personalized, but you want to ensure they have a really positive experience too while experiencing your product or your store or your storefront or your website. So at this point, when they make that final purchase, you want to make sure that you are still recording every touch point. You want to know how they walked through your store and how they browsed your website. You want to know if they put things in their cart and took them out. You want to know, you know, was it similar or different to their past experiences where they didn't actually complete the sale, but then also identify patterns about your customer. You know, with it, you can start deducing things about, you know, maybe why did they do this? See those patterns, how they walk through a store, how they browse a website and just really take that information and start identifying the, the patterns associated with it. Congratulations, you have now made the sale. However, a lot of times companies sort of drop the ball. Just because you've made one sale doesn't mean that a customer is gonna keep up coming back to you. We need to make sure that not only are we pricing competitively, but that we're also providing a really positive experience to make a customer want to come back, even if we're not the lowest price every time. After converting, you need to have those regular touch bases with your customer. You want to make sure they keep coming back because it's a whole lot cheaper, as we all know, to keep a customer than to get new ones. So use this opportunity not only to provide personalized you know, services and products that the customer has in the past purchased, but also use this as a great way to upsell and cross sell your customer. Make sure that they're learning about new products, things that they could potentially like in addition to the product that they're serving right now. And then you also wanna start rewarding loyalty so that they come back and then start, and then you get them to the next step of that loyalty where they become a brand advocate. So for example, in retail, a customer enters the store and is logged into the retailer's app. Let's say this is Beth. Beth comes in. She has a past purchasing relationship with this company. Um, so we already know a lot about her. We know who she is. We know what she's bought in the past. She's geolocated using our sensors. And then as she's moving through the store, she is notified with aisle specific offerings on items that she's purchased in the past, but maybe hasn't purchased recently. And then also complimentary products. So for example, Beth has been buying maternity clothes. We know that either she or someone she knows is pregnant because she's buying maternity clothes. Chances are there's gonna be a baby somewhere in her life in the near future. Start pushing out notifications about fun new baby products that are out there that she might not be aware of, ones that have recently come on the market, or coupons for diapers, because it's a complimentary good. Or the same thing if we go back to my you know windshield wiper example, we can, you know, if I would have been purchasing windshield wipers, chances are I probably do a few small things with my car by myself instead of taking it into the shop. As I move and walk by the auto department, push out oil that may be on sale or that you have overstocked. So I'm aware of it and can then go out and purchase it if I need it. It's not something completely random. For example, if you know I decided um, I had been purchasing oil and maternity clothes, you're not gonna send me out an example for like luggage because um, chances are I don't really need that. That's just sort of a random recommendation. You want a personalized recommendation. And then two, after they've checked out, notify them while they're still in the store about any complimentary goods that they've actually put in the cart and bought. 
if you get them while they're still in the store, there's a much higher likelihood of them actually going back in and making an additional purchase. For example, I use a drugstores app and a lot of times I'll go in, I'll make a purchase and then a few hours later I'll get like a, a note saying, oh, you know, you have additional coupons, you know, that have been sent to you. Well, I've already left the store. Chances are I'm probably not coming back for another week or at least another few days. I'm not going to go out after two hours of being in the store and go back. Whereas if they would have pushed that notification to me out immediately while I was still in the store at checkout, I probably would go back and purchase it if it was something I needed or was interested in. So it is critical to do this in real time. Do it as they're in the store because the chances of doing an upsell or a cross sell at that point when they're still in the store is much higher than if you wait even 30 minutes or an hour after purchase. So I know we've been talking a lot about retail and online. Um, let's switch to airlines and how can airlines retain their customers? So let's say today there's a flight from Chicago to Los Angeles and it's delayed by five hours. Now with it, there's a lot of people on this flight, but we're gonna focus on three people. We're gonna focus on our friend Beth again, Tom and Rob. And with it, we know a little bit of, of information about each one of these customers. We know Beth is a platinum member. She likes earning miles instead of vouchers. And in the past two months, she's had four flights delayed. And these are significant delays. These aren't like, you know, 15 minute delays. These are hour to five hour delays. So then we have Tom. He's also platinum. He likes earning dollars, so vouchers instead of miles. He hasn't hit any flights delayed in the past two months, even though he's traveled the same amount as Beth. Then we have Rob. He has no status. He has no preference for rewards. And he hasn't had any flights delayed in the past two months because he hasn't flown. Well, we know for this, you know, this inconvenience of being delayed five hours today, we're probably going to have to do something to reach out to each one of these customers in order to turn a bad situation into at least a neutral situation, if not a positive one. But we can't give them all the same reward because with it, it would be unfair because Beth and Tom are much more valuable than Rob is. And with it, with Beth, she's been inconvenienced more often in the past few months than Tom. With Beth, we're gonna give her, since she's been delayed so much, 10,000 additional miles. We're gonna to wanna to give her some substantial, warm, fuzzy, and additional miles. And then with Tom, since he really hasn't been inconvenienced that much in the past two months, even though he's been flying often, we'll give him a $25 voucher. You know, this is enough that, you know, he can put it towards his next trip and not be really angry at the, the five hour delay. And then finally with Rob, we might just give him a free drink voucher. We wanna make him happy, but we don't need to give him something that's significant. As you see, we have these three personalized offers for these three people who like different things and have different past histories. So with it, this is really important and it is critical to do this in real time because you do not want one of these customers to be angry, you know, they find out about the delay, they get angry, they take you know to Twitter or to Facebook and they start posting negative comments about your company. You don't want that. You want to avoid that. So if you do this in real time, as soon as it's delayed, this really can take a bad situation and at least bring it down to neutral. They're just like, you know, I'm upset that I'm delayed by five hours, but, you know, I'm getting a reward. It'll be, you know, maybe it's not that bad. It's OK. You know, these things happen. You don't want them to start posting about how much they dislike your company, about how your service is terrible, how you're never flying them again. You really want to just turn it a negative experience into a positive or at least a neutral experience. So in manufacturing, you also want to keep this in mind. So with it, make sure when, you know, if you're implementing a, an IoT solution at um, a manufacturing company, it's important to not only have sensors on the machine, but really on every item. So you can do it on forklifts, on like, you know, parts, um, and then also on people. You can have them wear, you know, Fitbits or some sort of wearable device. And when you're collecting all this information, you can turn it into great insights. You can provide valuable reports that give them really valuable information. So for example, you can see how people are walking through the factory. You can see how forklifts are being used and then where parts are going. You'll actually get to see how things are really being used because so many times companies have procedures and processes in place. However, in reality, they're not really being followed. For example, if you're having like a real time report um, that's generated whenever there's an exception, you can see if a product is being misused, a forklift is being misused, so you can correct it and prevent that from happening.
you can see if a forklift is being misused and you know prevent that from occurring again in the future you can see patterns with employees also you can see if they are you know regularly skipping a step this could lead to one of two things it could mean your step's not important or it could mean that you know your product's not going to be functioning as well because you're skipping a, an important step in there so this is all very valuable information to know and you want to know it as soon as possible in addition to this, this also can provide really great information to you as an, an OEM. So if you are making these sensors and making these machines, because with it, the information is going to be probably sent back to you. In that way, you can be one step ahead of your customer in, in figuring out what they need before they need it. And this brings us to the idea of loyalty. So the last step in the customer life cycle, this is where a person becomes or a company becomes your brand ambassador. It's really important at this step to keep track not only of disservices and satisfactions, but also to be one step ahead of them in knowing what they need before they know. And also at this stage, it's really important to do small surprise and delights just so they know that they're appreciated and they'll come back and they'll start to really you know, tell their friends and tell their colleagues you know, what a great experience they've had with your company and how maybe they should check it out. Okay, so let's say Jane enters the store with the store store's app turned on. Jane makes several purchases a year, about 12, so once a month, and she'll go in and she'll buy a hundred dollar pair of shoes. They are typically flat shoes or ones with like a one inch heel. And they're always normally around a hundred dollars in a size nine. She prefers whole hunt shoes. Sometimes it's hard to have a relationship with every frequent customer that comes into your store. So a sales associate is then alerted that a frequent shopper has walked into the store via their mobile device, the sales associate's mobile device. And not only does it have information about her past purchases, it also has recommendations that are pushed out to that sales associate of in-stock items in the customer size that the customer would like. So it probably would be, for example, if Jane wore a size nine shoe, the latest Cole Hun, you know, flat ballet shoe in a size nine. It wouldn't be something that they don't have in a size you know, nine or something with a really high heel. So then the sales associate can then make a recommendation to that customer based on their past purchases because there's a much higher likelihood that they'll purchase that than something that's, first of all, not in stock or something that they've never purchased in the past. This, in addition to this, if maybe the sales associate isn't available, if all of them are busy, the customer can at least be alerted to new products nearby that match the preferences that they've had in the past. So even if you can't have that personalized experience with an employee, the customer can at least be pushed out and alert to the new products that are in stock in their size. Um, so you are getting that level of personalization too. So on to another industry, so that of airlines. So let's say we have Joe Loyal, and he's a frequent flyer on RTE Airlines. So we know a lot about Joe. He's flies us quite often. So he typically makes reservations through a business email address. He always checks in via nap, rarely checks luggage. He prefers window seats. And on flights in the morning, he always orders tomato juice. And if he's flying after 5 p.m., he orders a gin and tonic. Normally, his company just pay, pays for coach. Um, sometimes he's upgraded to business class, but he will always purchase an upgrade on flights back home to Chicago on Thursday evenings, um, sometimes on other days, but especially on Thursday evenings. You want to make sure that all of this is taken into account to really make a personalized experience for Joe. So how can we make him more loyal? We know we're going to give Joe a window seat automatically, no matter what. And then too, an alert can be pushed to Joe two days before his flight to purchase an upgrade at a discounted price. I know a lot of times when you're flying into Fayetteville, Arkansas, there's a lot of uh, consulting partners and very frequent flyers on those flights. So a lot of times with it, when you fly in, even if you're typically like, you know, upgraded to first class, you don't typically get that, but you might appreciate that and be willing to pay extra. So with this, not only are you getting what you want, but also the airline is also getting additional revenue there for a, an actual purchase of a business class seat or a first class seat. And then finally, 
Flight staff can be alerted to Joe's preferences and you can greet him. So when he's flying in the mornings, you don't even need to ask him what he wants. Just give him a tomato juice um, or if it's after 5 p.m. and he's in business class, give him a G&T. They don't make him happy. It's these small gestures that really bring that loyalty that companies are seeking. So it's nothing huge. It's just the small personalizations that are ongoing that will really make him a brand ambassador. Then finally, um, with manufacturing, Take that information that you're collecting and predict what your customer needs next. So a lot of times, you know, people who are like floor managers or plant managers don't really know what they need next. They're very happy with what they're getting now, but they're not really sure what the next step is. So use this as an opportunity when you're collecting this information to have insights generated and new reports made that can really benefit your end customer. This gives you an opportunity to send out some, you know, emails to management or make sales calls and say, hey, you know, like, you know, we're looking at creating this new report. Let me give you a free trial. I think that this would be really helpful based on your past needs. It's alerting them to things that they don't even know they need. Um, and this really shows them that you know them and that you want to help them. You want to make their life easier. And this will transform them into that loyal company that tells you know their friends and colleagues about it. It will also make them your advocate when it's time to renew that service contract. So some key takeaways from this presentation, first of all, is record all the data that you can, even if it's anonymous. Keep track of that information because it will be useful. It will let you let the customer have a personalized experience. And then two, you'll learn more about your customers. So take it as an opportunity not only to, you know, give customers higher satisfaction and personalization levels, but also as free market research. Finally, the interactions need to be in real time. If it's not done in real time, the opportunity is lost. So the value is really lost for your customers and then for you, because not only are you not providing them with insights or new product recommendations, um, and they're not getting those when they need it, you're not getting the additional revenue or the ongoing revenue from them. Then finally, you wanna be personal, but not creepy. So with it, you don't wanna send out a generic email, but you don't wanna also send out an email where they suspect that you know a little bit too much about them. Uh, for example, one of my, my neighbors, she was very upset about getting this. She got this Facebook ad a few weeks ago. Um, she took a screenshot of it and sent it to me when I told her I was doing this presentation. This is actually a picture of her direct neighbor's house. The email ad states, you know, like, we just sold this place, let us sell your house too. And she was really very off put by this and she immediately, deleted Facebook from her phone. She turned off all like notifications. Um, she said she most certainly will never use this realtor. So with it, it's just you want to be personal, but not invade a person's privacy. Um, so with it, just some things to keep in mind, some takeaways from the presentation. Thank you so much for your time today. I work at a company called Intrigna, and we are a prescriptive analytics software provider. We make customized software for companies who are collecting big data in the IoT and want to do something with that data. So for more information, please feel free to visit our website and then also email us at info at